students, members of the press, and elected officials, I'd like to welcome you to our year-end, uh, semester-end uh, fellowship showcase for students who have been working here at the Kupferberg Holocaust Center at Queensboro Community College for the past semester or year. We have a few interns who have been working with us all year who will be sharing today their final projects and uh, telling us a little bit about the experience they had um, and how they feel that experience might stick with them, perhaps benefit them, perhaps give them a sense of direction um, for this summer and for many years beyond, we hope. The one thing I always feel is important to note at these uh, showcase events is that none of the students you're about to hear from today got any credit for what they did during these programs. This was entirely about taking time out of impossibly full schedules to create space for a different kind of learning and engagement with each other, with their communities, and with the world at large. Thinking back on my own undergraduate college experience, I know that I was in a place that had thousands of opportunities for me to learn and grow and find extracurricular ways to continue that engagement, and I avoided all of them. Um, to get back to my room a little bit faster, um, to surf the, I don't know what kind of internet we had then, but it was basic internet. Um, but you have made a different choice. I came to an awareness uh, of my responsibilities and my role in the world much later in life. And so all of you are very inspiring to me. I'm amazed at some, you know, some European countries where students choose majors in junior high school or something like that, and that becomes the path for the rest of their lives. And we tend to give ourselves much more time. We're more relaxed about those kinds of things. But each of you, and you're not all any one major, you're not all, you don't share a career or a vision or a pers disciplinary perspective. Each of you, for your own reasons and within the context of your own lives, experiences, knowledge, have made a choice, a conscious choice, that you didn't only come to the first day of this class, you came to every day of these meetings over the course of an entire semester. And we're very eager to hear what you have to say um, and to learn from you. Uh, and really, this is the highlight of our year here at the Kupferberg Holocaust Center because this is the, the longest and most sustained engagement we have with students. And therefore, it's our most direct way of impacting the future we hope to change for the better. So I'd like now to introduce you to one of our city council members for this area, who not only represents us, but is also a great supporter of our efforts. He has been tireless to try to help us get the money the community support, the relationships that we need to build a really strong and successful program here, and one that continues to grow and evolve. So uh, it's difficult to imagine what we, where we would be without him, and certainly our uh, leadership, student leadership fellowship that we did this semester in partnership with Queens College and Saru would not have happened. So I'd like now to introduce you to City Council Member Barry Grudenchik. Thank you, Dr. Dan, as I fondly uh, refer you to, um, to you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's wonderful to see you here today. And I am indeed um, very happy to have played a small role in uh, making some of the things at the Holocaust Center um, happen uh, both this semester and since I've taken office. Um, it all started, actually, uh, soon after I took office, uh, Dr. Felix Matos, who is the president of Queens College, came to visit me. And we were speaking for a while, and I, you know, there's always an ask, right? Because, you know, nobody comes to a meeting without an ask. 
I said, what can I do to help you, Dr. Matos? And he says, no, 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 he's a very charming man, as uh, those of you who have met him know. Um, and he said, no, 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 we're here to see how we can help you. So um, at that point, um, I guess it was early 2016, we were all, we were well into the, the presidential race, um, which produced our current president and the, the manner of intolerance and uh, just, uh, just incredible levels of intolerance that we saw coming out of our president's mouth. Um, he was then a candidate, now our president. Uh, disturbed me greatly, I know it disturbs uh, millions of Americans and probably most of us in this room. But um, I told him I was concerned about tolerance and um, very proud heritage that we have here in Queens, um, and I talk about it quite often, is a legacy of tolerance which began in Flushing over 350 years ago with the Flushing Remonstrance. Very brave people um, who demanded um, the right to worship and assembly freely, not only for themselves, but they quoted uh, the Egyptians, Turks, and, and Jews, which was a revolutionary concept um, at that time, asking for religious freedom for Jews and for Muslims was just, I doubt there were any Jews or Muslims in Flushing at the time, but it was revolutionary and it helped to form the basis of the Bill of Rights in the U.S. Constitution. So I told Dr. Matos I was worried about tolerance and he told me about Seiru and I went to visit and um, I was determined to, in, in any small way that I could, good afternoon, Dong Chum. Uh, George, you're going to sneak in, right? I was, I was determined to, uh, to try to expand that. I don't represent the area of Queens College, although I grew up across the street in Pominock Houses, but I do represent the area where this wonderful uh, educational institution sits. So we were able to bring Seiru to, to Queensboro, and I guess it made sense that, uh, that the Holocaust Center would work with it. Um, I want to thank you for your work. I'm not going to be able to stay for this whole program. It just happens to be a very busy afternoon. I have to be, it's Mother's Day on Sunday, so one of the senior centers is, well, somebody once, <laughs> I was thinking about Ralph Kiner, who was the, um, one of the original Met broadcasters, and uh, he once said, um, it's Father's Day at here at Chase Stadium. I want to wish all the fathers a happy birthday. <laughs> so um, you never know what your tongue is going to get you in trouble. But to get back to the, to the matter at hand, um, I have been a strong supporter of the Kupferberg Holocaust Center. Um, I've met recently actually with the two of the Kupferberg brothers and thanked them for their family's work. I've known them for many years. Um, they run a very little known company called Kepco in Flushing, which produces all kinds of amazing equipment for airplanes, um, avionics and such. And they've been very generous, not only here, but also at the Kupferberg Center at Queens College. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I really want to thank you for your work, and I urge you to continue it. Um, one person can make a difference. I was looking for Bobby Kennedy's speech. Um, he spoke in South Africa about the ripples of hope and he cited how one, often one person in history has made a difference. And I often think of the, in, in the Bible of, of Ruth. Um, she had nothing. Father-in-law died, husband died, brother-in-law died. So there's three women left. Sister-in-law goes back to her family. And there she is all alone with her mother-in-law with nothing. Yet, she is now the ancestress of, of the Messiah in the Bible. So we don't know. I was talking to some young people at IS-109 in Queens Village today. We've done a lot of work at that school. And I tell them, you don't know when you help somebody. You don't know the effect you have on somebody's life. You really can't know. You don't know what's in people's hearts. But believe me, when you work and you strive to build um, a web of uh, of tolerance, as I'll call it, and you work with people to bring people together to get them to understand that while we may look differently, we are all the same. Uh, the genes that separate us and make us look Asian or make us look African or European or whatever we might be are this much, and the genes that make us human beings are this much. Um, so I want to thank you and I, I urge you 
um, as D Dr. Lesham said, to continue your work. Uh, I know it takes a lot. I get up a lot of mornings. I'm out very early, and you know, if I'm home by 9 o'clock, I consider that a victory. But I'm very lucky. I get paid to help people for a living. Uh, it's a wonderful feeling, I, I can promise you. And we have wonderful partners in the community. Um, Case has been, you know, been happy to continue funding their programs um, and to fund so many programs that promote tolerance and bring an understanding. We are a diverse community, but we all want the same things. We want good schools for our children and our young people. We want safe streets. We want economic opportunities, good parks, which we have out here in Eastern Queens, and I can go on and on and on. Um, but your work is helpful, and we need to build we need to take down those. We don't want to build walls. We've got enough walls. We want to build tolerance, and we want to build understanding and uh, mutual acceptance of each other. And that is the way you build a stronger community. And I think, you know, when, um, when, I, when I talk to people who don't represent Queens, when we have uh, people who come from other parts of the country, they are marvel at our diversity. Uh, my district, uh, most districts in Queens, the average is 50% foreign born. That's the average. Uh, my district is 42% Asian American, um, East Asian, South Asian, doesn't, you know, it, it's just an amazing, uh, and it's changed so much since I was a young person here in Queens. But I do want to thank you for your work. I know uh, we're providing, along with the other, some of the other elected officials, certificates for your work. Uh, frame them, put them up on your wall. Let them inspire you um, to do even greater deeds, uh, good deeds, because that is really how we move society forward. Few of us will leave with this. You know, Dr. King, very special. Uh, he only lived 39 years before he was murdered. But look at what he did. Look at what he did. Not by himself, but he's the acknowledged leader of, of the civil rights movement in the late 50s to the 60s. He was the person, but he inspired millions. And he changed the course of history. You may not change the course of history, but you will change the course of people's lives by working to bring people together. So thank you for your work. Um, enjoy Mother's Day. It's going to rain probably. Maybe it won't rain on Mother's Day. Whatever it is, just enjoy it and be happy. I, if you're with us, you're in the right place. How's that? This is it? Take a seat. Relax. There'll be food later. That's okay. Thank you, God bless, and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you for your work. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Asia Gray. I'm the Director of Fellowships at the Center for Ethnic, Racial, and Religious Understanding at Queens College. Um, and I am the director also, or the co-facilitator of uh, one of our fellowships here at Queens College, which just um, started this semester, um, the Dialogue Fellowship. So thank you all for coming out to hear about um, our fellowship and also hear about the, the, the work from the fellows themselves. We know as uh, Council Member Grindincheck reminded us, there's a fierce urgency of now, right? There's a time that is precious and important right now for us to be engaging in more opportunities for better understanding between each other, for better ways to communicate between each other and for more interaction. And so the Dialogue Fellowship really offers students and, and really people of the community an opportunity to learn how to do that. How do you speak to people who are different from you, who are from a different background, a different religion, different cultural um, expectations? How do you do that? And so through this fellowship, it's a semester-long fellowship, we really get into how to go about having those difficult conversations that arise from time to time, not only with people who are of different backgrounds and persuasions, but with people who are similar. You know, some of those conversations that really sort of cause a lot of tension and debate. And then we also allow people to really explore um, what is bias, what is discrimination, what is prejudice, so that when we have these conversations, we're coming from a place of understanding and a place of knowledge. Um, so we had five, um, six wonderful fellows this year, which I know in the beginning were sort of like, oh my gosh, we are having to talk about those things that no one wants to talk about, right? It's like politics, race, and religion, right? And so in all of those times, we were talking about all three and, and also talking about gender and also talking about sexuality and also talking about nationality. And we were asking them to really speak up about their own ideas and really asking them to interrogate what they think about themselves and what they think about others. And through that process, we, we got to now. And it's funny thinking back at the beginning of the semester when you, know, you ask someone about race and they're like, 
you know, anyone want to comment on, on, on their understanding of race, then, you know, it's, it's so quiet you could drop a pen, right? And so now we not only had people talking about race, but inviting other people to talk about race. We had a dialogue here with about 50 faculty, students, and community members talking about race. And they were able to facilitate a wonderful, dynamic, robust conversation with all of these different people and have them uphold agreements so that people weren't feeling disrespected in this conversation, that people felt free to share their stories and really listen and hear what other people have to say about their racial experiences. So it's funny going from you know so quiet, quiet, and then for them to really sort of take hold of, of who they are and be able to facilitate those conversations. So it's, it's been quite a paradigm shift um, with the people who are involved in the fellowships. And, and so it's wonderful to have us here at this, at this important opportunity for them to speak about their experiences and how they understood the fellowship for themselves. So we have uh, Luce Davis here who's going to talk about her experience um, with the Dialogue Fellowship with the Kuferberg and Saru. Um, I would like to thank Saru, QCC, the staff of the Kupferberg Holocaust Center, Dr. Dan, and um, Assistant Director Marissa Hollywood, and of course, Councilman Bar Barry Grodencheck for making, for making these dialogue fellowships possible for the students at uh, QCC. The experience, the experience has been truly uh, insightful and eye-opening to say the least. I also um, want to take a minute to thank our wonderful facilitators, uh, Asia Gray and Chrissy Ramkarin, for working with all the students who participated. Before this fellowship began, I avoided tough conversations. That is dialogue that I knew would be uncomfortable or hard to navigate. My way of dealing with it was the silent treatment. My fears of verbal attacks or even worse, being humiliated would cause me to shut down. So when I received the information from Marissa about the Dialogue Fellowship and read what it was all about, I immediately saw this as an opportunity to learn why I had these fears and perhaps overcome them. During our time at the fellowship, we were given a book to read called Crucial Conversations, Tools for Talking When Stakes Are High. While I was reading one of the chapters that focused on safety risk and conversations, I, became, I came across these words. As people begin to feel unsafe, they start down one of two unhealthy paths, silence or violence. I didn't realize that my silence during my own crucial conversations was unhealthy. This was an eye opener and an important turning point for me because I considered my silence a good thing. For me, it kept the peace and it kept me in a safe place. But ever since that revelation, I am so happy to stand before you today and say that it has become much more easier and much less intimidating to engage in tough conversations that at one time made me feel somewhat disconnected. Conversations such as race, religion, and discussions on different types of social identities. I haven't over overcome all my fears, but I have acquired the skills and on how to create a safe space for myself, for others, so that together we can express our experiences and our opinions without the fear. One of the most helpful aspects of the fellowship for me was when a couple of weeks ago we were given the opportunity to facilitate our own dialogue with QCC staff, for, with the faculty members and the students. And the topic was, does racism affect us all? As you know, QCC is a very diverse campus, so going into the dialogue, I was very nervous. But our facilitators, Asia and Chrissy, gave us great instruction. They gave us really good examples and walked us through the process. I'm so grateful to you both. I learned to listen rather than to focus on my own opinions, how to create and maintain a safe, space for others and to make sure that everyone had an opportunity to share their views. The skills I have learned during my time at this Dialect Fellowship will remain with me going forward in my new conversations at home, my place of worship, with friends, family, and absolutely through my career as a nurse. 
I have learned, I have also learned that words can hurt and wound. But when they are used wisely in our conversations, they can change entire atmospheres where healing can begin. Thank you. All right, that was amazing. I don't know how many of you were here last semester at the end of December but Luce gave a presentation then about her experience in the Holocaust Fellowship, where she also had the opportunity, a unique opportunity, to go and interview a Holocaust survivor in Howard Beach um, in his home and to speak with his wife and his daughters. And it was a very emotional experience. And I think I overcoached Luz for the presentation. And she came up to the stage and sort of struggled a little bit and then spoke really fast and then stopped. and. It was great, all her content was great, but looking at the difference between how you present yourself and how comfortable you seem up here, this is an aside, I should have introduced that. This is entirely an aside. But looking at the difference between how you presented yourself then and how you present yourself now and how effective your communication was, I'm, I'm struck. Even though I know it wasn't a public speaking class, I think it speaks to kind of a deeper comfort with your opinions and your views, so. Bravo, Chrissy and Asia, and Luz for the hard work you did. Um, so we have uh, one other speaker for um, the student leadership class, but we're going to wait um, a little while to hear from him because we would like to turn to some of our other fellows now. Um, and I would like to acknowledge and introduce you to this year's Asian social justice um, interns, who, as you may know, look at Japanese war crimes in East Asia during World War II, primarily having to do with the issue of Korean comfort women. And the class as a whole has selected two of their members to do presentations, and we'll get to see PowerPoints. So those of you who feel like no presentation can be done without a PowerPoint, you will be satisfied shortly. Um, but before I invite them up and before I invite up their instructor, um, let's try to get the whole group up like we did last time for a quick photograph, and then we'll hear the presentations. Um, just as you heard from Barry Grudenchik about the importance of an outside party sometimes to um, make a reaction happen. I think it's a catalyst. Don't, call, don't quote me on it. I don't remember my chemistry. But just as Barry Grudenchik really helped um, create the conditions under which the last fellowship happened, the Asian Social Justice Fellowship um, rides and falls on our wonderfully collaborative relationship with uh, an organization in the community. You all visited them last night from this class and that's Korean American Civic Empowerment. And I'd like now to introduce CJ to talk about their work and uh, why they work with us. Thank you, Dan. Uh, my name is CJ Park. I'm the staff attorney for the Korean American Civic Empowerment. And all you, I mean, interns came to our office yesterday, I mean, last night, to to interview Ms. Young Soo Lee, who is a victim of the comfort woman. And unfortunately, we couldn't do it. You know, uh, the thing is, is, we were all said we were waiting for it. But now she's in the middle of her 90s, 90s. So she had to go to hospital in the morning emergency situation. So we couldn't do it. But I found out that she is OK now. So now she's OK. I hope you know we can. Um, reschedule the interview again, maybe hopefully one or two weeks later. But uh, we have been, you know, thanks for this uh, Kapabog Holocaust Center. We have been doing this internship for years. Uh, to th I believe it was 2012. We are still operating this uh, program with a uh, good relationship with this Kapabog Holocaust Center. I uh, really appreciate Queen's Community College and Kapabogo Holocaust Center. And 
Also, we appreciate uh, Ms. Professor Tomomi, who is taking charge of this program. And we hope you all learn from this program about, uh, we are talking about, you know, equality and not discriminating anything. You know, we are about this comfort woman issue is related with, I believe it is, uh, uh, the community, I mean, the sexuality, I mean, woman, I mean, you know, during the war, the government, you know, uh, systematically um, utilized the woman for their soldiers. And also we see this issue was not uh, well known in Western world. You know, we wanted to see that uh, this issue is being recognized as as serious uh, human rights violation in Western world and to in you know in the world, so I hope all the interns learn about this and then to be become a witness for the victims. You know, still we have. I know there are some deniers for the Holocaust deniers. We have a country, whole government, that denying it who committed this, but still denying it. So we don't, I don't want to you know, blame any government, but you, know, you may know that it's Japan, Japanese <laughs> government <laughs> is still denying it. And their prime minister, uh, you know, I, I heard that last week, you know, they still wanted to you know, uh, deny it and get some support from the, the right wing supporters in Japan. So Ms. Lee, she is going to heading toward to to Japan next week to protest to the Japanese government, but we're still fighting for it. We're still fighting for the acknowledge of that that the crime. So we hope all of the participants here become a supporter for that, for that cause. And thank you for. I mean, that was, that is it. thank you. So we had a weekly session in this room, and I just want to briefly explain what we did in this fellowship. So obviously, uh, most students didn't know anything about comfort of women. So uh, first half of the semester, we read uh, various scholarly articles in history, uh, international law, sociology, surrounding comfort of women issues. So students got basic and some somewhat expertise knowledge about comfort of women. And I sensed that the student uh, developed sort of unsettling feeling because obviously the comfort women, uh, victim survivors, their justice was not served yet, has not been served yet. So uh, with this unsettling feeling, we started to shift our focus to what we could do, what we can do uh, developing uh, independent project. So today you are going to uh, hear two students' projects. And yesterday we had six students presenting their uh, project, uh, which were all very wonderful. But we have only two students uh, presenting their ideas. Um, so I'm going to introduce two students. Izzy Ezekiel Shin, he is originally from South Korea, and Nyasha. Chi Yam, Chi Yama, she's from uh, Zimbabwe, and and uh, um, Iziko is graduating this semester, and he major he's majoring science, mathematics. mathematics I'm sorry, and Nyasha is ma majoring right now majoring chemistry, but she's probably changing to chemistry, pharmacy. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so. We are going to start with Ezekiel. So my name is Ezekiel Shin. I'll start my presentation. Uh, it'll turn on soon? Yeah, there we go. OK. I was kidnapped from Korea with 100 other people, where they took us to China by a train. They started to drop off two or three people at different places along the route. I was dropped off at a, at a place where there were about 20 other people. The soldiers took me to a room immediately and began to rape me right away. Later, when two girls refused the soldiers and called them dogs, the soldiers hung them on a tree, cut off their breasts, and when they died, 
they cut off their heads and put it in boiling water and threatened us, with, threatened us with our lives if they didn't drink the resulting broth. This is the testimony of Lee bong Nyo, one of the many testimonies that I read this semester, which shocked me and horrified me and urged me to fight for social justice. I grew up in South Korea, where I used to see the women crying on TV because of the pains in their heart. At a young age, I was not sure why they were so upset and angry. But as I grew up and learned about the atrocious details, I was horrified and this semester I decided to join the fellowship at QCC. Today, I want to share what I learned during the semester and I want to share what we can do to make a change. So in order to change the image of the Japanese Imperial Army after the incident at Nanking where the Japanese army raped and killed thousands of Chinese civilians, Emperor Hirohito decided to create a comfort women system to satisfy the needs of the, the Japanese soldiers. According to Watanabe Kazuko, a Japanese journalist, it is estimated that there were about 200,000 comfort women, which 80% 80 of, 80 of those women were South Korean, while the other 20% were from countries such as China, Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, even Netherlands, and other parts of Europe. Here's an example of a real comfort station back in World War II. The women were given Japanese, Japanese names and were physically beaten and humiliated. They were forced to serve between 30 to 40 men a day, and they were closely guarded in small tents and small rooms, which they had to share with three or four other people. If the women tried to escape, the soldiers would cut off the nerves in the foot or leg so they couldn't escape. The Japanese government tried to burn all documents after World War II that were related to the Comfort Women Stations. And the Japanese government has tried numerous times to deny their involvement in the comfort system and said that the comfort women were just hungry for money. However, Japanese, Korean, and American historians found incriminating documents in Japan and Washington, D.C. to support the cries of the comfort women. And also, the women's rights movement all over the world urged the Japanese government to react, and the Japanese government couldn't deny their involvement any longer. According to Washington Post article called Tokyo Seoul Resolved Dispute Over Sex Slaves in World War II, end of 2015, the Japanese government and the Korean government met up to settle the dispute, but it was not a victorious day for the survivors. The survivors wanted a direct written apology from the Emperor of Japan and a direct compensation. However, the Japanese government maneuvered their way out of the settlement and just made a statement that stated that the Prime Minister apologizes for the, all the actions of the past and we will start a fund that, will, that supports the cause and that this should be never discussed again. Uh, this issue should never be dis discussed again. The surviving comfort women were enraged because they did not get what they asked for and now the Korean government has decided to shush out the event. The Prime Minister of Japan, Abe, is known to be very right-winged and has ordered all the textbooks in Japan to not include any atrocities of the Japanese army in order to prevent the sense of humiliation of ancestors. The Japanese government has also threatened the Korean government to remove all comfort women statues, such as this one in front of the Japanese embassy in Seoul. Oh, sorry, it's another picture. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. So what can, we, what can we do to make a change? The most important thing you can do is know the historical truth and spread the knowledge. Many Japanese right-wing activists utilize incorrect historical facts to prevent humiliation of their country and call the comfort women prostitutes and that say that we should not worship prostitutes. I want to share some of the ideas of my fellow classmates in order to raise awareness for, the, uh, for this atrocious event. One idea is that we could help organize classes or fellowships like this in other schools and after school programs. Um, this would help spread the knowledge to the younger generation of students and hopefully encourage them to fight against social justice. Another idea is to create merchandise such as this t-shirt my classmate uh, designed. And the yellow ribbon is symbolism for bravery, perseverance, and hope. And the bird on the right is the national bird of South Korea. For my final project, I want to propose to bring the Statue of the Little Girl, or also known as Statue of Peace, to the QCC campus, which is marked as the second statue in the US, after the one in California.
What the survivors want more than anything is that people can learn from these atrocious events and that such social injustice should never occur again. We need to spread our knowledge and learnings and we need to make fast, decisive goals. Due to the fact that there's only a handful of survivors left and they are in fact very old. In fact, just yesterday we went to interview a survivor through Skype who is 95 years old, but she had a medical emergency and was taken to the hospital right away. So it shows how time is ticking for many of the survivors. But you may ask, why QCC to place the statue out of all places? In our school's, in our school's mission statement, we state, the college affirms its open admissions policy and its strong support for intellectual inquiry, global awareness, and civil, civic responsibility. And the statue would be a prime example of showing what our school stands for. Also, the statue would serve as an important learning tool for the students that come on our campus the younger generation of students that come on campus. Sure, it is possible to put, it, put the statue in other places that will get more attention, such as Manhattan or Central Park. But I believe putting the statue in QC would be better for three reasons. First, it will save a lot of time and cost. Putting the statue in other places, such as Manhattan, where it's very concentrated, um, where it's heavily concentrated, it will take years and the, and the cost will be extremely high. On the other hand, we can get the statue to QCC in a matter of months or even weeks. Second is because Queens has the largest Korean population in New York. So it would only make sense to bring the statue to our community. And for the last reason, I believe the statue belongs with us because this is just the start of the movement. And I want our school to be part of it. In April 2017, just a month ago, the US Supreme Court declined the review of a controversial case seeking the removal of Comfortable Women Memorial Statue in California. This can be taken as a green light for Comfortable Women Peace Memorials to be anywhere in the US and has to start somewhere to show that it is possible and that we, st we stand strongly against social justice around the world. It will cost roughly around $25,000, but it is a small cost compared to the years of suffering the survivors had to face. I strongly believe that with community funding and student fundraising at QCC, we can cover the cost and this will fulfill one of our fellowship's main goals, which is to find out what the survivors want and see how we can help. With the school's support, we can contact the folks at Glendale and set up an online meeting in order to obtain necessary information to directly or indi indirectly contact the sculptors who brought the first statue over to America. To conclude, I may sound ambitious, but I was not always so. In 2008, I graduated Bronx, Science of, um, Bronx High School of Science, and I went to University of Rochester. And at that time, I was not sure what to study, and I followed the dreams of my mother was being a doctor. After three semesters, I failed out, and I decided to join the Korean Army and serve my time for two years to gain my dual, dual citizenship. With a new set of mind, I came back to University of Rochester, but however, my financial aid did not come in time and I had to withdraw once again. This time, it hit my parents harder because I had broken their trust again and they decided to cut up their ties with me. So the next seven months I spent, um, I was homeless. During this time, I, I lost all will to live and I called myself a failure. It was also during these seven months that I saw how much social injustice was in the world and how the strong kept getting stronger while the weak kept getting weaker. I also saw that nobody cares about you as long as it doesn't affect him or her. They say that the people who experience the most have the most to give. I want to help the weak and those who cannot defend themselves. I was fortunate enough to find a job through an old employer and I was able to get back on my feet. After two years, I finally decided to give education one last chance and QCC was the only school that opened his arms to me. One of the hardest things I had to do in my life was taking accountability of my past failures. By admitting that I had failed and made a mistake, I was able to work passionately to improve myself and help others. And I noticed the immediate change. I'm happy to say that I'm a 4.0 student at QCC. And this semester, I'm taking eight classes. And I have been accepted to Columbia University next semester to study mathematics. So thank you. I hope the Japanese government can take accountability for their past atrocious actions 
instead of hiding it, and they will notice a positive change also. This fellowship has given me the tools and weapons to war against social injustice, and this fellowship has opened amazing doors of opportunities for me. And I will use the perspective and knowledge I learned during the fellowship to continue the movement at Columbia University. For the last point, I don't know if you guys walked around campus, but we have a lot of sculptures or structure that is pleasing to the eye, but doesn't serve any purpose. So what, it is time that our school has meaningful structure that will show what our school stands for. Thank you. Statue, you don't need to contact anybody in California because our organization helped them to have that. Wow. So we wrote the word in the flag. Wow. So you don't okay. need to go there. <laughs> so if we all kick in five dollars, Case will kick in the rest, and we'll have that statue out on our terrace in no time. Um, it's just $1,000 per slice of pizza that we're going to bring in soon, and we will have that statue today. Um, it's good to laugh a little. That was such an amazing uh, and brave and moving um, presentation that um, I instantly felt bad that I had asked you to give us your personal motivations, that maybe I had pushed you too far, but it seemed like you were revealing what you wanted to reveal. And it was very powerful, and I thank you for sharing that with us and trusting us with that. Um, I'd like now to introduce the next presenter from the Asian Social Justice class, Nyasha. Please come up. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Nyasha Chiangwa, and I will be doing a presentation on comfort women. Um, I, titled, I entitled it Breaking the Silence. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I'm originally from Zimbabwe. I came to the U.S. in 20... Thank you. I came to the U.S. in 2013, right? 20, 2013, 2014, somewhere there about. But, yeah. And I am a freshman in this college. So... So when I joined the fellowship, I saw an email advertisement about comfort women survivors and Japanese invasion of some parts of Asia, and this happened in World War II. So I wanted to join because when I did my history class back home in Zimbabwe, there was nothing about comfort women in our history books. And it surprised me because it happened in World War II. I learned about World War II, but then I did not know about this, and I wanted to understand why didn't I know about this. So I went to the library. And then I wanted to find out more, and I realized that there are only two books in the library about comfort women, and some of the publications are not in English. So I went online to look for some sources to understand more, and then I realized that they are very short video clips, and most of them were done by BBC and CNN as reports to what was happening, like the movement when the comfort women survivors started coming out, but it is not so much about the actual history because it's just reporting. And then the reporters, they just talk about what they have to talk about, and it's five minutes. So um, the other articles that I found, they were also not in English, so I could not understand anything. So this gave me a reason to do my project on translation and why it is important. So for something as this, the comfort women, system which made many women and children sexual slaves and it changed the entire course of their lives because some of them cannot eat certain foods because it triggers memories of what happened to them and what they ate. Some of them could not go back to their families because of the prevailing culture at that time because in Korea at that time, if you were raped, you're not supposed to talk about it and you will not find support from your family or your friends. And because um, it was important for a woman to get married while they're still a virgin. When they were raped, they could not get married anymore. And most of them did not actually want to have anything to do with men because of what they had suffered. And they lost their <coughs> excuse me, dignity and pride and self-esteem to strangers that they did not know about. 
And it's shocking that over 50 years, they could not talk about what happened to them when they were so enslaved and they lived um, in such inhumane conditions. So this is just a little map, and I'm just going to explain a little bit. So <clears throat> this is Japan, right? This is Japan right here. And then that's North Korea and South Korea, and then the Philippines, Taiwan. And these are most of the places in which um, Japan invaded. So what had happened was that, just a brief history, the Japanese wanted to free some of these parts from European um, colonization. So they promised the people that if you let us you know, be your colonial masters, we're Asians like you, so we are going to um, be kinder and nicer to you. So the people wanted Japan to free them from European colonial masters. And then after that, the Japanese did worse than what the Europeans did. And then they started building this system of comfort women because every man who was born, every son who was born was supposed to be a soldier for the emperor. And every girl was supposed to serve some way to the emperor because the emperor was their god. So even if you're um, raped or you're a sexual slave, as long as it was done in the name of the emperor, it was OK. Oh, sorry. So from my understanding about the comfort women issue, many articles have been written, but they are not written in English. So I feel that there is a need that these books should be translated so more and more people can understand what happened back then. And if you understand what happened back then, maybe perchance the way you think about other people, how you perceive them, and how you see them is going to change. Because when you think of yourself, as superior to everyone else, you're not going to treat them like a human that they truly are. Because um, at that time, the Japanese thought that they were superior to other Asian cultures. So they had the right to do anything that they wanted to them because they were their colonial masters. And they thought of them as subhumans. And then um, to also achieve this, it is important to have workshops that talk about these things and not only present the comfort women survivors as, um, as victims, but also tell the story of how they survived and the strength that they had and what made them to go on against such odds and to give um, some form of hope to people who today suffer from, um, who have been raped, who have been sexually assaulted, and in the worst cases, um, people who, have, who are victims of human trafficking. So to keep up also with modern times, it is important to digitalize some of those books because most people want to read things online. So everything that can be made into something digital, it will be very important to um, look into that. And translating books and articles will not only be enough, but then having a holistic approach to this is going to be more helpful. And also, one of my colleagues talked about Facebook because these are the statistics. Most people use Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest, and um, linked in every day. These are the statistics that daily most people use Facebook, so it is important that if we can put these things out there online, most people might say it. And also putting um, ads wherever we can, or even art on walls, it is, it is going to be very helpful for people to know and to raise awareness about the comfort women system. So I understand that there was a movie that was made in South Korea, and then it became the favorite in the box office. And if we could have a movie like that in English, it was going to help people to understand and to bring shed more light on the comfort women system. And the reflections and what I learned about. I learned that if mentality does not change in people, people will repeat history. There are so many things that have happened in the past. Talk about World War II, but still today you have got people, millions, who suffer from um, human trafficking. They are promised jobs, they are exploited, and still it happens in the 21st century. If you look around this room, there are so many things about um, genocide that have been 
that 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 are advertised not advertised sorry that are posted right but then you, if you look at the timeline you've got 1915 1932 1937 it's still coming and you've got 2003 and then the question is why is it that we never learn it is because the mentality that was back then is still what we have now when you think of yourself as someone superior when you object when you think of women as nothing good but for just sexual gratification if you want to exploit people for whatever reason that kind of mentality is what makes people repeat history and but not history repeating itself because what happened in the past happens today because we still think the same of other people thank you Uh, we are delighted today to be joined by another one of our very important and uh, close uh, elected officials. Um, the man who is sitting to my right, um, Assembly, New York State Assemblyman David Weprin. Um, if you don't know the name, you should. If you've ever been to one of our events, you probably have heard it. Was instrumental in helping this Holocaust Center move out of the basement of the library about 10 years ago. Um, and helped us. We had, from I wasn't here then, but we had sort of the local city council people working and then in concert with the state folks. And luckily, David and his brother, one of them was in the city council and one of them was at the state level, and that worked to our advantage. Um, and we were able to build this big, gorgeous building that has a classroom, has a library, has exhibition spaces so that all these kinds of programs can happen. He's also a sponsor of this student fellowship program. So I'd like to invite you to hear from uh, Assemblyman David Weprin. Thank you, Dan. And I think we have official um, assembly certificates and assembly jackets. Did you all get them? <laughs> what? We have them right there for them. We have them right there on that. <laughs> right here. Uh, should I call them up? We, uh... We'll do a picture after. OK. That's fine. Um, and um, we have a couple of Queensboro connections. Uh, Casey Leiske, who's taking the pictures over there, is a graduate of Queensboro uh, before, uh, before going on to uh, SUNY Cortland, was it? SUNY Cortland she graduated from. And uh, now she's on my staff uh, working in our uh, Fresh Meadows office. So, uh, you know, it's a Queensboro uh, success story. Uh, and my uh, wife, Ronnie Weprin, uh, Ronnie Wave right here is uh, <laughs> the special events at uh, Queensboro and uh, is involved with a lot of the uh, students and in, in various uh, programs and uh, <laughs> and I'm on her staff. Um, but uh, it's wonderful these internships. Um, you know the diversity uh, represented uh, at the Holocaust Center, the uh, diversity of uh, the genocide, um, not just uh, you know the horrors that happened uh, to Jews. Uh, during the uh, the Holocaust, where six million Jews were killed, but we have many uh, international genocides from all over the world in many different periods of time, and that's one of the wonderful things about this uh, Holocaust Center that it recognizes, uh, you know, threat to humanity everywhere, uh, because when you have uh, a genocide against one people, it's really uh, so important that we all speak up, not to repeat history as the uh, the last um, intern uh, just. Uh, demonstrated, and it was a wonderful presentation. I caught most of it. And um, I, I love coming to events like this uh, to hear from you and uh, how touched people are uh, by the uh, research that they do and the experience that they have. Um, and uh, we've had you know, a number of, uh, New York, first of all, Queens in general, the district I represent is so diverse. We have uh, over 200 different uh, countries of origin and uh, languages and dialects represented right here in Queens. Uh, more than 50% uh, of my district constituents uh, are first born in another country, more than 50%, about 60%, which is a, not, I'm not talking second and third generation, I'm talking first generation. Uh, and, and that's one of the wonderful things about Queensboro here. It's one of the wonderful things about Queens in general. Uh, and it's so important that there's a hate crime against one group that we all speak out because the next time it'll be a hate crime against someone else. And that's what leads to uh, some of these acts of genocide. And uh, we have to really uh, cut off hate uh, and inhumanity uh, before it rears its ugly head. And we have to, uh, we have to all speak out. So, uh, you know, I want to thank you for participating in this program. I want to thank Dan. 
uh, for the great work uh, that he does here uh, at the Kupferberg Holocaust Center. And I'm just so happy to have played a small part uh, in bringing you up here and uh, really uh, participating in, in so many of your important activities. And it's the young people that get involved that are so important because you'll tell your parents, your grandparents, uh, your friends, your neighbors, and then your children, your grandchildren, so uh, eventually. So it's, it's so important that we, uh, we not repeat history, and it's because of internships like this, because of centers like this, uh, that uh, we will hopefully never repeat uh, the horrors of the past. Thank you. Thank you. If I can now invite, I know it's a lot of stand up, sit down, it's like services. Um, if all the students from all the internships could come up for a minute and we can take a picture with Assemblyman Weprin, that would be great. We have one more group of interns that we're gonna introduce and let them show you a few things. Uh, we had two interns this year who met the traditional definition of intern, meaning they worked for us. Um, <laughs> And they both got amazing projects and made remarkable progress, as you're going to see. Um, so um, they actually were paid for their time. Um, but they didn't need to do this project, and they didn't need to do it here. And they didn't need to do it with the integrity and the seriousness with which they accomplished their mission. So since Shoham is already up here, um, I'm going to ask him to go first. And let's full screen it. Where is it? Thank you. <laughs> In just a few minutes. All right. Uh, so my name is Shoham Chakraborty, and um, I worked on this website uh, cataloging all the um, documents from the jacket, the Dachau jacket exhibit. Um, so this is what the homepage looks like. Um, I'm sorry, everything you're seeing here, he built. I gave him images, he made this. Wow. Yeah, I started with a, uh, um Excel file of documents and turned it into this. Show some examples. Oh, there we go. Yeah, really cool. So, there's, a, there's I think, ab about, yeah, it looks like 329 items in here. And uh, we have documents ranging from uh, affidavits, certificates, letters, uh, ID documents, um, describing, you know, Ben Perez and his family's journey. And yeah, I learned a lot making this. Um, I de definitely did not expect to um, to learn about such an such a personal experience to this project. Um, and it was really interesting. Um, let, me just, let me just keep you here for one second. Literally, I handed him a spreadsheet that said these are 350 documents and a little bit of description. And here's 300 files. And I said, make it so that anyone online could find our entire collection, search based on keywords, and view all of the different objects. So, and we wanted it to be in standard archival slash library format, so library harvesting systems could identify and find our objects and serve them up to people and Google. And um, Shoham found a free online archiving software solution out of George Mason University um, that built the database and then it had an extension that allowed you to create a site that would show what you had done. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really a wonderful project and we're about to go live with an online version of the exhibit and this is going to be linked to it because obviously the exhibit is a selection of the materials and this will mm -hmm. allow people full access to all of it. So thank you Shoham. So Sindel's project, unfortunately, I can't pull up from here. It's not on our network. Um, but you can describe the work you did. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sindul Day. Uh, my work uh, um, is basically uh, I made uh, 
a collection of available to people all around the world uh, who can uh, they can look on online uh, from so in a special thanks to mr dan for giving me uh, this wonderful opportunity uh, i really feel honored to work to help holocaust holocaust center and to make it collection available for the people from the all over the world so yeah growing up in uh, bangladesh i did not know anything about the holocaust but i i did uh, i understood what i it mean to be on a minority so yeah i got i got a new perspective from this internship and i've been sharing with my family and friends thank you everyone all right another person who doesn't know how to brag about their accomplishments and only to fill in a little bit um, with Sindul, I brought him from our center has been open for 30 years, right? But my predecessors believed in paper and just memory. So we have almost no documented history of what this center is. So I brought Shoham like these archival legal boxes that had 10,000 folders and files in them. And I said, turn this into something I can search. But this didn't need to be online. It's for us. This is our institutional records, um, including the research on 30 different exhibits we've done, where we had different licensing agreements with each institution about which images we could use and how and what. And so Shoham spent, uh, Sindo spent the whole year, really, on our scanner with thumb drives, running back and forth, saving PDFs, doing optical character recognition. Um, so that almost every piece of paper, he kept coming and saying, I ran out, and I'm going in the back, and I'm like, oh, I found this sheet on the floor. I have no idea what it is. <laughs> might, be, might be the pizza receipt. Uh, but um, he really just diligently, and I was worried that it wasn't that interesting of a project, but very diligently uh, put it all together. And, um, you know, I just learned, I don't know. He's an amazing guy, so join me in thanking him for his work. Okay, one last thing. And then we'll eat. I'd like to invite um, Chrissy and Asia up, please, who led our Saru Social Justice Student Leadership Conquering the World Fellowships. Stay here. Tomomi, please come up. And Marissa Hollywood, who coordinated everything, I'd like to invite you up as well. So please join me in applauding their wonderful efforts and accomplishments over this past semester. All right, pizza is served. Thank you all for your patience and for coming today.